The Last Shaman by Hua. The girl's eyes were sharp and cut like a knife. She stared livid holes into the faces ahead of her. Only her eyes could be seen as she was camouflaged within the massive bamboo leaves. Her ragged clothing clung to her skin in the heat of the day. The only thing she had with her was a clothed satchel, strung around her body like armor, in which she carried the morning's hunt. At her side was her younger sister, Ishii, who was just as silent and furious. The pair of sisters clutched the knives in their hands, trembling with anger as they watched the party from a distance. This party was all decked out today. There were at least a few dozen of them, men, women, children, and monks, as if they were out for a picnic or celebratory gathering. The sight was disgusting and unbearable. At the head of the group were two Taoist monks, sitting on bright red and golden chairs that were being carried midair like they were royalty. There were umbrellas on tall sticks that blocked them from the burning sun. The monks held a bundle of incense sticks in one hand and a string of beads in the other. They were chanting an audible prayer over the group, almost in synchronization. Right behind their carriages were a band of drummers. The loud booms of the drums could be heard all the way back at the sisters' village. Scattered all around and behind the monks and drummers were an entourage of men of the Han dynasty. Their voices and laughter rang like hooves, despicable and audaciously, without a care in the world for what they were about to do. The party stopped right at the foot of the burial ground, marked by tall stacked rocks and red twisted twine from funeral ceremonies. They had found another burial site. As if committing mass massacre of her people weren't enough, they were now bringing the war into the spirit world. Her people would never rest in peace. Itzi, we should go. There are too many of them, her sister urged calmly, but the tone in her voice was stone cold with fury. Itzi wasn't as calm. Her knuckles were going white around the knife she'd been clenching. The drumming of her heartbeat was almost as loud as the drums behind the despicable monks. She couldn't reply, in fear that her rage would escape her lips with her shaking breath. Itzi, we don't have to see this part again. No. Her voice was quiet but firm. We should see this part. The whole world should see what they are doing to us. On cue, the Taoist monk's chanting came to a standstill, and a hush rang through the crowd. Then suddenly one of the monks said as nonchalantly as ever, It is done. We may begin. Five men with shovels appeared from the crowd and scanned the graves. Each grave was marked with a stack of stones and some dried fruit and flowers. One of the shovel men spat at the flowers, then hastily kicked the stack of stones out of the way. Itzi held her breath, blood rising to her head as she did everything she could not to jump out of the forest and put her knife to use. They began digging. Shovel after shovel, they pierced through the resting beds of the Miao graveyard. These were her people, deceased relatives, aunts, uncles, children, for heaven's sake. Itzi closed her eyes and clenched her jaw tilting her head to the sky as she heard the shovels hit solid wood. May the heavens see with eyes for the unseen. May the earth hear for those who cannot be heard. May the truth bring punishment and justice as is rightfully so. She repeated the old spell quietly to herself, trying to stabilize her breathing. Ishii grabbed her sister's arm and pulled her back away into the forest. What do they do with our ancestors' bones? Itzi had been curious the first time she'd seen an event of this kind happen. Her grandmother's mouth opened, but nothing came out at first, as if the truth was too horrifying to even speak. Itzi was still a young girl then, but it had always been her grandmother's teaching to never hide anything from the youth, even things that were better off unknown. They sell them. Why? People buy them. What do people do with them? People eat them. Boil them as medicine in soups. Boil the bones? Hmm. Itzi felt sick to her stomach. The sight of Han men with shovels opening up the wooden caskets, laying out a quilted tarp to catch the bones as they picked them out of the caskets, all made her queasy. Sometimes the bones were easy to remove, as the deceased bodies were already decayed into hardened bones. But other times, 
The men would use a knife to scrape the rotting human flesh off of the bones before retrieving them. The first time she'd seen this atrocity, she had turned around and hurled all the contents of her stomach. The next time she saw it, she went home and cried until her eyes were bloodshot red. These religious priests, monks as they called themselves, were vile in the name of the heavens. They prayed over the skeletal remains of her people and abused the dead with the protection of their holy beliefs. Itzi swore she would never be like them. Itzi and Ishi's grandmother was the last shaman in her village and in all the surrounding Miao villages that they knew of. During her prime, people from all over had come to beg her grandmother for a ceremony or prayers. Her grandmother had performed hundreds of thousands of ceremonies. Unfortunately, Itzi would only witness a few last ceremonies before her grandmother passed a few days after her 17th birthday. It's been years now that Itzi and Ishi have been on their own. Their parents had died many years before when the sisters were still just young children. Most of the strong young men have been recruited into the Miao army to fight against the Han. Their village was dwindling. Before her grandmother died, she had given all of her possessions to the villagers. The only things she had passed down to Itzi were her shaman tools. All of the items fit in a large, heavy bag. There was a bronze gong the size of her head, but flat and had a rope handle. The gong had a drumstick to go with it, with a soft red cloth sewn at the end of the stick. The gong sound during a ceremony would allow the shaman to go into a trance, thenceforth following the sound to enter and return from the spirit world. There were also two sets of bronze finger bells. Her grandmother had shown her how to hold the bells, one on each finger, two on each hand. These bells were for the shaman to communicate with the spirits, to give power in her speech. In the bag were also two pairs of bull horns, shaved and cut straight down the middle to split the horns in half. This was a divination tool, mostly used to confirm with the spirits whether or not a ritual has gone well, or if more work needed to be done. There was also one single red veil. Itzi had seen her grandmother wear this veil during every ritual performance she did. The thin cloth wrapped around her head like a hat and covered her face in the red veil. This was the shaman's veil of protection, so that no evil entity may stick onto the shaman as they journeyed into the spirit realm. The last item in the bag was a bundle of strings. They were red and white strings that had been strategically twisted into one striped string. These were protection strings. Every year, her grandmother would make hundreds of these strings, enough for the whole village. Then she'd spend days and days tying each one on each person, reciting a protection spell as she knotted the strings around everyone's left wrist. Itzi looked down at her left hand and felt the skin around her wrist where her string was. Her sister, Ishi, had tied this one for her. The last one her grandmother tied had fallen off after a year of wear and tear. She had no idea what to do with her grandmother's shaman tools. The inheritance felt like lost potential, no longer useful to its lost owner. What use were of powerful tools if she couldn't even handle them? She could just feel her grandmother's disappointment. Itzi and Ishi made it back home to the village before lunchtime. A group of small children with bowls of corn kernels came running at the two, followed by a flock of chickens. Even the ancestors could not have stopped this catastrophe, as one child slammed face first into Itzi's stomach, dropping his bowl of corn kernels. Then another child tripped on the bowl, falling straight into the ground along with his bowl of kernels. Then the outbreak of feathers and beaks and screaming children as the flock of chickens descended upon the fallen corn. Itzi and Ishi grabbed the children up from underneath the chickens, pulling the group to the side before they were gobbled up. Thume, what on earth are you guys doing? Ishi shouted, laughing as she patted down the children to brush off the corn. The group of kids huddled around the sisters as they began to recount their eventful day of feeding chickens. Not only will you run out of chicken feed if you give them too much, but you'll also make them very fat. Ishii playfully scolded the children. Ishii has always been a great caretaker. Children and even adults came to her for comfort whenever they got hurt. She was like a young mother, taking care of the whole village. Before the children could disperse back to their play, 
the sound of galloping horses raced up to the group. Two men, dressed in metal armor with swords, appeared. On their center chest plate was the Miao symbol, an embroidered diamond. Ishii hushed the children and pushed them back behind her as the men climbed down from their saddles. We are looking for Itzi Li, one man claimed loudly, eyeing the two women. Itzi stepped forward cautiously, her eyes narrowing in on the soldiers. I'm Itzi. What are you here for? The two men held their hands together in a cupping motion in greeting and extended it to Itzi. We have been sent here by General Zha of the Miao Army. He has called upon you in dire need of help. Our men are suffering. We need a healer as soon as possible. But I am not a healer. Itzi frowned, turning to look at her sister. Our grandmother was the last healer in the village, and she has passed for many years now. We understand that, Sister Itzi, but we are in dire need of help. As we understand it, your grandmother had left her gifts to you, and the gift of healing is passed down by every other generation. This makes you the most capable person of possessing any shamanic skills within all the villages in the Miao province. Itzi shook her head and took a step back. No, you don't understand me, soldiers. I did not receive the gifts. I cannot see or heal anything. I cannot perform rituals. Grandmother only passed down her tools to me. The two men gave each other a look, then turned back to Itzi. Please come with us, sister. The general will be the one to decide our next course of actions. Itzi. Her sister sat on the edge of her bed while she packed her things. She packed her grandmother's shaman tools just to show the general that she wasn't kidding when she said she only had the tools. What if you just don't go? Her sister mused. I mean, we don't know if they are actually from the Miao army. We don't know anything about them. What if you go and they realize you are no use to them and decide your life's not important enough to send you back? She went quiet, and Itzi did her best to ignore her sister. What would I do without you? She sighed and sat down next to her sister holding her hand out to her. Ishii was just a few years younger than Itzi. She was definitely the more beautiful of the two. Unlike Itzi's naturally thin, frizzy hair, her sister had long, slick black hair that went down to her waist. She had beautiful high cheekbones that gave her face elegance, which paired well with the grace in which she carried herself already. Unlike Itzi's sharp, piercing eyes, Ishii had the most friendly and welcoming ones as if she was always ready to help where she could. She wondered why Grandmother didn't pass her healing abilities onto Ishii instead. I won't be gone long. Itzi held her sister's hand in hers. Tuku is right next door if you need help with anything. He already runs to your every need anyway, she teased. Her sister scoffed and looked down at the ground, squeezing her hand. There is enough food to last you through the season. The children and elders here need your care. You will have plenty to do before I'm back. And what of you? What if you don't come back? Her sister's worried voice trailed off, just as there was a loud knock on the bamboo front door to their little house. If you leave now, we may never see each other again. I will come back. If not on horse, then by spirit at the least. Itzi finished the thought in her mind. The expedition took three days to arrive at the Miao army camp. The soldiers with her were attentive and respectful of her, only speaking to her when necessary. The older of the two, Va Lung, was at least two decades older than Itzi and was quiet, kind, and extremely skilled. He started the fires, cooked the food, looked at tracks to make sure they weren't being followed, and overall seemed to be the one in charge. The younger soldier, Boje, was younger than Itzi herself and was very friendly. He spoke to her more casually and listened very well to Valung. He gathered wood and leaves, caught fish and squirrels, and mostly tended to Itzi whenever she needed anything. Once they arrived at the camp, the two led Itzi to the tent at the base's center. General Zha came out to greet them, cupping his hands together and extending it towards Itzi. Sister Itzi, welcome. Thank you for coming. The general's voice was smooth and commanding. He was younger than she'd imagined, maybe just a few years older than herself. At first glance, 
Itzi could understand why he was a great general. On his way out from his tent, he had greeted each soldier he passed with a quaint nod of the head. He was the most well-respected Miao soldier, feared by the Han Emperor himself. But here he was, humble and defenseless. Only one man guarding him at his side. Itzi lowered her head slightly, cupping her own hands and holding them out to him. Thank you, General. After their exchange of short pleasantries, Itzi, Valung, Boje, and the General's right-hand man with him, Yaking, made their way into the General's tent for discussion. Itzi caught the General up about her inability to perform any shamanic rituals and how her grandmother had not passed on her shamanic abilities to Itzi, only her shamanic tools. Itzi sat across from the General at the discussion table looking defeated as she explained herself to the group of soldiers. The general did not say a word until Itzi was completely finished speaking, only to shift in his seat and nod slowly in understanding. His men looked to him, waiting for a reply or direction on how to continue. The general cleared his throat and stood up from his seat. Well, Boje, please take Sister Itzi back to a spare tent. Give her food and water. The rest of the company stood and the general turned to face Itzi. Sister Itzi, please stay with us a few days before you return. Itzi paced back and forth in her tent. She had eaten her ration and asked Boje when they would be heading back to her village, only to be met with an unsure shrug. It could be days, weeks, or months before she could return home. At this rate, it really was less expensive to just keep Itzi there for life than to send her back home. She grumbled at the thought and continued to pace, tugging at the string on her wrist. She tried her best not to think of her sister or family back at the village. The thought only worried her, and she needed to stay calm. The first few days she was at the camp, she saw little of the general. He left early in the morning to scout the area and returned late at night. Only Boje was left to accompany her. There were no other women at the camp, so socializing or having anyone to guide her in army camp living wasn't ideal. There were a few hundred men. Each tent housed half a dozen men or so. On the fifth day, Itzi thought she would think herself insane if she stayed in her tent any longer. Each morning she had packed her things and wore them on her body, just in case the general gave them the order to return. But as the order hadn't come for almost a week, Itzi stopped packing her bags. Her boredom had to be worse than her fear of coming into contact with any Han soldiers, or her fear of never being able to return home. This morning, instead of being met with galloping horses on their way out to scout, she was met with just the general and his guard, Yaking. The two were practicing hand-to-hand -hand combat together. Itzi curiously made her way over to the two to watch. The general was powerful in his stance, and each move he made. He didn't attack as much as he defended when Yaking striked. Each time he did step to attack, it was calculated and heavy. He was very tactful. Yaking, on the other hand, was extremely swift. He was slimmer than the general, and his punches didn't carry as much weight. But before Itzi could even blink, he would have already avoided a blow from the general and moved three steps ahead. They were a sight to see, and definitely made a good team. The fight only came to an end when Yaking couldn't avoid a blow from the general, taking the hit right in his chest. He stumbled back a few steps and the general grabbed his arm to stop him from falling, apologizing for the hit. Yaking only chuckled and cupped his hands, raising them up to the general. No need. Always a good run, general. He spoke curtly, then raised his gaze to look at Itzi, the two noticing her for the first time. She smiled promptly and cleared her throat, making her way over to the pair of soldiers. Good morning. She nodded her head slightly. Don't mind me, I'm just here waiting to go back home. She joked, laughing mechanically, and trying to learn. You guys are amazing. Good morning, Sister Itzi. You'd like to learn? The general chuckled. I might as well make myself useful here while I'm waiting to leave. Well, if you'd like to be useful. There are some other less dangerous things we could use your help on. The general nodded. Oh, I'd love to help, as long as I can finish them before leaving for my village again. Itzi kept cluing in, 
but the general seemed blissfully unaware of her request as he instructed her to follow him through the camp. They came to a table with a stone grinder. On the table was a bowl of soybeans and a bucket of water. Itzi blinked and looked at the materials, then to the general, genuinely hoping the man was just jesting with her. Ever made tofu before? The general crossed his arms, tilting his head to her. I, I mean, yes, I have, but tofu is very laborious. I usually make it with my sister. Well, have at it here, he nodded. We will need some by dinner time. And before she could respond with anything else, he was already fifty paces gone back towards his tent. Itzi huffed and looked back at the soybeans, very much regretting having come out of her tent this morning. It took her a minute to clear up the station, watering down the stone grinder and washing the soybeans. She thought about Ishii and how the sisters would each do a different end of the task. Itzi would do the grinding first, hands gripping the grinder's handle and pushing and pulling to maneuver the stone in circles. Ishii would take on the task of adding soybeans to the grinder's feeder on top and adding water at intervals to make sure nothing gets stuck so the soybeans are crushed easily into the outpouring soy milk from the grinder's spout. Then, once Itzi felt her arms going sore, she'd switch with Ishii and they'd go back and forth. I don't know if even a soldier could do this by themselves. She grumbled and added a few handfuls of soybeans to the top of the grinder, feeding it into the stone's entrance. She took a deep breath and dumped a cup of water into the feeder as well, before rushing to start the grinding, pushing and pulling on the stone's handle. Before she could even start the stone crank, all of the water she had poured in gushed out of the grinder's spout. She groaned. This was going to be a long and tiring day of waiting. After three hours of trying to grind the soybeans by herself, Itzi finally made just a small pot's worth of milk. She probably sighed and complained more times throughout the three-hour process than she'd ever done in her life. The bowl of soybeans was still very full, and the water she'd used barely made a dent. She cleared everything up and decided that would be enough for the day. Itzi started to drain the soy milk through a mesh cloth, filtering out the bean grits until the final milk was smooth. She carried her small pot of milk over to the stone stove nearby and started a small fire to heat the milk. Boje had been gracious enough to find her lemon and vinegar, in which she used to curdle the milk. By the time she was done making the tofu, her arms, legs, and shoulders were aching. It really was dinner time already, and the general's posse surrounded the small pot of tofu. I haven't had any for months. The last time was when I went back home for half a day. It looks delicious. The general looked impressed and offered Itzi half a smile, nodding his head as he looked at the content of the pot. Very well done, Itzi. We would love to have some for tomorrow as well. The spoon damn near fell out of Itzi's hand at the idea of making some more tofu the next day. Forget about going back home. Forget about staying here at camp forever. General Zha just wanted Itzi dead, this was certain. The next day did arrive, and although Itzi tried to sleep through the morning until after the soldiers left the camp, the general had sent Boje to remind Itzi to make more tofu for dinner. She grunted and groaned and rolled around on the stray mattress of her bed before sitting up, huffing loudly enough for all of the camp to hear. And soon she was at it again feeding the grinder soybeans and water and trying to roll the grinder faster than the water could escape. This became Itzi's daily task for the next three weeks, but she had really lost track of time. Each morning, General Zha would send Boje to wake Itzi and remind her to make the tofu. And each morning, Itzi would grumble and complain and wake and make the small pot of tofu. She had almost completely forgotten why she was there in the first place. This tofu-making just became her daily life. Day in and day out, Itzi appeared with her little pot of tofu. Though her body was busy and occupied with tofu-making, Itzi's mind was left wandering about. For three weeks straight, she thought about Ishii and her village. She thought about her grandmother and how disappointed she'd be to see Itzi right now. Whenever she needed a little more motivation to grind harder, she thought about the Taoist monks and their nasty umbrellas.
She even thought about the sparse memories she had of her parents. Her mother was kind and beautiful. Her father was strong and diligent. The day before their death, Grandmother had lit an incense stick and made a prayer to the ancestors. Her parents were on their way back from the Han capital. They had gone to restock on supplies for the village. Her mother was a seamstress, so she would haul loads of fabric back and forth. Her father was a woodworker. He loved making little knickknacks for the children of the village. He'd made her a small gourd pendant and multiple wooden bird sculptures. On their way back, they were ambushed by Han bandits who recognized her parents' awkward Han accent. They were murdered on sight and robbed of their entire haul of goods. A villager who had gone with them had escaped and returned home to let Grandmother know of the ghastly news. But by the time Grandmother made it to the site, everything had been cleared out. Her parents' bodies were never found. Grandmother returned home, and Itzi saw for the first and only time ever Grandmother cried out and melted down to the ground. Her mother had been Grandmother's only child that she loved and coddled dearly. Grandmother cursed at the heavens, screamed into the wind, and beat the ground with her fists until they were bloody. She had known something would happen, and she had begged her daughter not to leave. Not this time. But Itzi's mother had held her mother's hands and reassured her not knowing that would be the very last time they would see each other again. Itzi thought back to the day before her parents' death, as she watched her grandmother light the incense stick and pray. The memory crept back to her like a dream. Her grandmother's prayer seemed to escape from her memory through her lips, as if she were a channel for the hushed-toned words, breaking out of the moment in time. She sang the words like a song, repeating what she'd heard her grandmother say that night. The scent of incense began whirling all around her. The spinning of the stone grinder came to a sudden stop by Itzi's grasp, and her eyes grew larger in astonishment at words coming from her own mouth. It felt like her grandmother was speaking the protection spell right through her very own lips. Itzi almost fell back onto the ground when the memory slowly faded and the song came to a stop. The sound stopped, but the prayer continued, repeating itself over and over in her head like a horse running back and forth within her mind. That night, the tofu soup Itzi had conjured had doubled in size from her normal small pot, and the general smiled proudly. How did you know? Itzi woke early to the general practicing his sword work on a wooden dummy one morning. How'd I know what? How'd you know that the soybeans would make me learn? The man just smiled knowingly and gripped the hilt of his sword, driving it straight through the dummy's straw chest. He turned to her and withdrew his sword, sheathing it swiftly. Every skill needs practice, focus, and belief, Sister Itzi. Your grandmother left you bells and a gong. Mine left me a sword. You don't get somewhere by going nowhere. Even if that somewhere is making tofu? she protested. Even if that somewhere is making tofu at first, he nodded. Do you know how a sword is made? You take a chunk of rock, preferably the good kind, steel. Then you throw it in a fire pit until the rock becomes so blazing hot that it becomes soft. Ironic, isn't it? Then you can use a hammer and other tools to shape the rock into a sword. Am I the hammer or the sword? You are the magician, Sister Itzi. You get to choose. Itzi's days of grinding soybeans became less of days and more so mornings. She still woke every morning as the soldiers left to scout, but it took her less and less time to make her tofu. She made more and more tofu each time as well, feeding just the general and his crew first, then slowly feeding the tent next to them, then the next as well. And soon she'd made enough tofu every morning to feed everyone at camp, even before the sun began its descent in the sky. She was very proud of herself, feeling like an accomplished magician each time she set the giant pot of tofu out for the soldiers. She continued to learn new, technically old spells as well. They continued to come to her through her memories of her grandmother as she made the tofu. The process of grinding the soybeans allowed her to quiet her mind enough to remember the important things. She started to write down spells and long chants that she was afraid she'd forget. This was a trance state, 
she had realized one day while grinding beans. She was going into trance while grinding soybeans and making tofu. She only realized this because she suddenly remembered a memory that she had no recollection of being present at. She was looking through the eyes of her grandmother as her small, wrinkled hands picked at the leaves in their garden. These are for tea. Good for coughing. These are to be mixed with ginger. Good for stomach aches. Her grandmother headed into the forest and began picking at random leaves and shrubs that Eatsy never even knew were useful. These are for warding off spirits. Twine them between bamboo and leave them at the front door. These are for healing wounds. Toast them a little and simply wave them over the wound with this spell. During the afternoons to evenings, Eatsy made her way out of camp to the surrounding forest to pick leaves. She tried to remember the ones in the visions of her grandmother. The general had reluctantly allowed her to leave camp with Boje as her watch. She was thankful only because her baskets became heavy with herbs and leaves, and Boje would be the one carrying them. On one of their outings, just as Itzi finished picking her basket of herbs that day, she heard screaming coming from camp. Boje grabbed her arm, and the two dropped their baskets, speeding back to camp. There were five soldiers sprawled out on the camp floor, all of them wounded and bleeding profusely. A dozen men surrounded them, trying to stop the bleeding. The general was in Yaking's arms, only half conscious with blood smeared across the meow symbol on his armor chestplate. They were ambushed. Itzi stood frozen for a second, staring in shock at the commotion of the scene. She was in the end, just a village girl. She had never seen so much pain and death at once. She had only heard of it and attended the funerals of elders in her village when the time came. Blood sputtered out of the general's mouth, and Itzi's ears rang like a bell, screeching her back to her senses. Boje, go grab the herbs we dropped in the forest. Yaking, I need boiling hot water right now. She dropped down next to the general, her heartbeat racing in her ear. We need to clean the wound. I will light the herbs. She looked around at the soldiers surrounding them. There is too much air here. We need to move them inside a tent or build one around us. The soldiers moved quickly, everyone either in tears or silence as they set up a tent to enclose the soldiers. After hours of cleaning, wrapping, and pounding of herbs, four of the five men were stable. The blood had stopped, and the other soldiers were feeding them medicinal soup from the herbs she'd gathered that morning. The general, despite their efforts, was going pale and had lost consciousness completely. Sweat was pouring down Itzi's temples as she continued to work on the general. She was burning the medicinal herbs and wiping him down in them. She had forced tonic down his throat, only for it to wash out again. She scraped down his whole torso with an egg and the back of a spoon like her grandmother had taught her. But he was not coming back to. Itzi's breath was shaking in panic. She didn't know what else left she could do for him. She began to cry silently, tears streaming down her own sweaty and panicked face. She couldn't do it. She couldn't save him. The medicine was not working. Just as she thought she'd drop dead herself from the hysteria she was feeling, she felt Valung's hand on her shoulder. Daughter Itzi, calm down. He instructed her to sit down first, quite literally forcing warm water down her own throat. There is nothing that we can do for him right now. We just need to wait and see if he can come back by himself. The elder soldier's words echoed in her memory, like a key unlocking a door to something she'd never explored before. Come back by himself, she repeated. He doesn't need to come back by himself. Itzi, what are you? I will go get him and bring him back myself. I will go into the spirit world for his spirit. I will do a ceremony. Itzi looked down at the general, almost pleading in her eyes. Practice, focus, and belief. I believe I can do it. Believe me. The ceremony was called Soul Retrieval. This was an extremely exhausting ceremony with many parts and steps. She had been old enough to see grandmother perform multiple of these ceremonies. She had Boje gather the multiple items she needed to begin. Yaking helped her create a temporary altar inside her tent where the general was moved to. Valung hunted for two chickens and set up a makeshift bench for her to use. 
she taught Beaujé how to ring the gong for her through the entirety of the ceremony. Finally, she reached for her grandmother's big, heavy bag of shamanic tools. She slipped on the finger bells, two on each hand. She took out one string from the bundle and tied it around the general's left wrist, speaking the protection spell under her breath as she nodded it. Then she grabbed her red veil cap, tying it tightly around her head. She lifted the veil to give Beaujé the signal to start the gong, then turned to look at the general one last time before Itzi turned back to her altar and lit three incense sticks. She must make it back from the spirit world before the sticks burn out. She held her breath and made a prayer, this one straight to her grandmother for help and guidance. May the heavens see with eyes for the unseen. May the earth hear for those who cannot be heard. May the truth bring punishment and help me bring justice as is rightfully so. She took a deep breath, pulled down her veil, and began.